walked into a room, you know, he just sucked all the oxygen out of it. Everybody wanted to be next to him. He lived larger than most people. His, he thought larger. He was bigger than that. He was always groping for answers to difficult questions. But that is wrong, it's cruel, and it's evil, and it has to be obliterated. There were problems that he took to heart. And you'd always find him uh, tackling the more complex social issues that most people would tend to want to stray away from. Certainly there is more to be done, but I think we're committed to doing that. His love for people was evident in, in, in everything he did. This is a very small world. Our neighbors are suffering tremendously. There were no little people as far as Mickey was concerned. Everybody was important. He wasn't afraid to talk to those people in the most powerful places in this land and say, what are we going to do about this? This has been my life's work, to help humanity where I can, and I will help humanity wherever. With what we have been given by America, we too have a responsibility to that humanity that I allude to. Lugnito, a small remote village near the border of Sudan, is a camp of more than 70,000 people who have fled into Ethiopia. Most are children who have made their way on foot across hundreds of miles of war-ravaged plains of southern Sudan, looking for food and safety. On a rainy day on the 7th of August, 1989, Mickey Leland and a party took off from Addis Ababa headed for this remote area in western Ethiopia. Their mandate was to help the hungry of the world. Their plane never made it. There was a report that uh, the congressman's plane was missing. I was at home. Uh, in fact, I recall specifically now, El Franco Lee called me, and he said, um, Mickey's plane is missing. And so far, they have gone to the roughest terrain, uh, and they have found no evidence of, of a plane crashing, and that is good news. We had the hope against hope. We had to hold on. It was traumatic. When I first heard that Mickey was lost, my thought was that Mickey was sitting around a fire telling stories and just didn't want to call back and let anybody know that he was OK. You know, we were going to see him walking out of those woods one day and uh, that everything was going to be all right. He grew up in a two-story house in uh, the Fifth Ward of Houston. And when he was three, his father left his family. When he was seven, his father sent him a bicycle. And when he was uh, 21, his father died. Mickey Leland attended Atherton Elementary and Phyllis Wheatley High School. He then attended Texas Southern University. He went into pharmacy um, and college intending to go to medical school, but soon after uh, was propelled into government and politics and left his fledgling pharmacy career behind. As a result of Mickey's political activities, John and Dominique Demonil spotted him. John Demonil was quite an interesting character, uh, liberal, leftist, very, very wealthy. He was determined to make a difference in Houston. Curtis Graves introduced him to Mickey Leland, and John Demonil fell in love with Mickey. And from that time on, uh, he was a major supporter of, of Mickey Leland. The Damonils were these extraordinarily sophisticated and civilized people, but basically they funded his political career, which gave him an enormous amount of freedom. They were very supportive of Mickey because they found in him someone who had a similar capacity to be concerned about others. It was a time when change was afoot in Texas politics. I mean, Mickey really was a sight to see when he, when he first showed up. He had, 
He had an afro about the size of a basketball, and he wore a big old chain around his neck and a daishiki. And First time I saw him, I said, I don't know what we're doing here. Who is this guy? First day of the legislature, the Speaker of the House had to go down and beg him to take the chain off and that she can put on a suit because he couldn't come out on the House floor without a suit and a tie. First man I ever saw was Gary Perth. Um, and I said I thought it was legitimate because uh, men had to be bag men in, in politics to carry the money they needed. And suddenly Craig and Mickey showed up and it was like the Craig and Mickey show. Um, the Texas legislature had never seen anything like this. And yet, he would come over with some of those old people that were some of the most right-wing, reactionary, conservative, whatever you want to call them, don't change, head in the sand groups. And before you know it, they got together and they started to like each other. Mickey wasn't in it for himself. He wasn't in it to get famous. He wasn't trying to get rich. Uh, you know, he was trying to help people. Mickey realized that he could accomplish more for more people by doing that than he could by making a living for himself um, as a pharmacist. Nearly a week passed with no sign of the missing. But hope had not been forsaken. Leland's disappearance is causing an outpouring of concern all over Houston. This morning, Houston City Council members prayed for him and others with him. Last night, 400 people attended a prayer vigil held for him and the 13 other people on his plane. For now, the search for Leland and his entourage has ended in Ethiopia, where it is 8 o'clock at night. We all pray that he's safe and that he and the others with him on that humanitarian mission uh, will be found and that they'll all be safe. Shedding his dashiki, Leland made his way to the United States House of Representatives, filling a seat vacated by Barbara Jordan. Mickey was a talker, and Mickey would talk with anybody about anything. And even though they disagreed with him uh, and sometimes hated what he was saying, uh, they ended up loving him as a person and he loved and respected them as persons in spite of the disagreement. But he would also do things that were kind of off the, uh, the beaten path of being Houston's congressman. He never limited himself to that. Uh, Mickey jumped on every issue that came up, to be honest with you, uh, making sure that the uh, bilingual amendment to the Voting Rights Act stayed in place. I was working for him when he went on the floor of the House and spoke in Spanish, which is in violation of the House rules to speak in a, in a foreign language. Mickey knew all along that he was part of a larger cause. One of the great things about him as a person was that he learned to educate his constituents that he would fight for their interest, but fight for larger causes too. He was a civil libertarian. He was a humanist. It had nothing to do with the color of his skin. So if he talked about the rights of Palestinians to Israelis, it wasn't as a black, it wasn't even as an American. It was a passion of civil liberties, of human freedom. It's Friday, and we've had false signal after false signal. And, and they still have not been found. With our technology, with our sophistication, there should be more definition of this thing by now. The search had grown into a national obsession in Ethiopia. Regular flights were canceled. The American military arrived and with the aid of the Ethiopian Air Force combed hundreds and thousands of square miles. The cooperation was extraordinary since the relationship between Ethiopia and the United States at the time was strained. But Mickey Leland was not an ordinary visitor here. One of the reporters asked me earlier, what was I going to do different than I had been doing for the last 10 years? And I said, nothing. Mickey had a, a wisdom that was um, beyond his years. I mean, Mickey was like smart. When I say politician, he know how to make the right trade-offs. When I say diplomat, he could connect people who otherwise didn't communicate. You know, Mickey was a statesman now, and he was an international figure. 
Mickey had a natural affinity for Israel, the state of Israel. Mickey loved the state of Israel. Uh, Mickey had been there several times and uh, uh, felt very special of walking uh, where Jesus had walked. Mickey always uh, supported underdogs, and Mickey felt very uh, uh, akin to the plight of Palestinians. Uh, for him, it wasn't a, an either-or proposition. It was a both proposition. That is, you didn't have to select one side or the other. You could be for both sides, and, uh, and that's really where Mickey was. He started a program that still lives today that sends um, a dozen high school students, primarily inner-city students, who go and spend six weeks in Israel, living and working and traveling throughout the country. To bring a group of young people to Israel was to challenge them uh, in a way that they'd never been challenged in the United States. Mickey understood the importance of us not making the Middle East a racial issue. And he understood the complexities of it. Mickey's thought about Cuba was a little different. He consistently would talk to families who had relatives and friends and cousins or whatever um, who were still there with uh, living in Cuba and of course they wanted to get them out. He felt like, which was kind of crazy at the time, you know, well, I'll just call him up. I'll call Fidel up and, and you know, we'll, we'll get those people out and he'd be able to do it. At that time, he has a personal uh, relation or friendship with uh, Fidel Castro and I think he was able to um, talk to him and, and beg him or ask him for our freedom. It was just a simple thing to him, when to other people it was a miraculous thing. You bet against him all the time and, you, and you'd always lose. He did that across the board in lots of different arenas, um, using his own personal contacts and ability to transcend politics to bring people together. It took almost two weeks before searchers finally found the wreckage of the Twin Otter. Roger, copy. This is a uh, sighting. The plane is located. There are no survivors. The bottom of the fuselage was completely disappeared. One of the engines was gone. He reported back uh, positive identification of Congressman Leland. And when you realize it's happened, you, you try to, you know, wipe it out and forget it. You just can't hardly imagine Mickey Leland being dead. themselves into nameless graves, while every now and then some great soul forgets himself into immortality. My friend Mickey Leland was in love with life. I remember Mickey Leland who's come to work sometime with a wrinkled suit, and I said, Mickey, y'all wrinkled. He said, this is wrinkled sheep, brother. This is linen. The biggest loss is for the millions of people who didn't know him at all. In most cases, didn't even know his name. The poor, the homeless, the hungry all over the world. I remember the brother that got on a plane and flew several thousand miles and carried 100-pound sacks of food so that human beings could eat, so that children could not starve. And he was single-minded in his purpose of breaking down those barriers and making this world make sense for the things that he died for are now on us. The people of the world need you.
can, and I will help humanity wherever. With what we have been given by America, we too have a responsibility to that humanity that I allude to. Pugnido, a small remote village near the border of Sudan, is a camp of more than seven... Tackling the more complex social issues that most people would tend to want to stray away from. Certainly there is more to be done, but I think we're committed to doing it. His love for people was evident in, in, in everything he did. This is a very small world. Our neighbors are suffering tremendously. There were no little people as far as Mickey was concerned. Everybody was important. He wasn't afraid to talk to those people in the most powerful places in this land and say, what are we going to do about this? This has been my life's work to help humanity where I can. 70,000 people who have fled into Ethiopia. Most are children who have made their way on foot across hundreds of miles of war-ravaged plains of southern Sudan looking for food and safety. On a rainy day on the 7th of August, 1989, Mickey Leland and a party took off from Addis Ababa, headed for this remote area in western Ethiopia. Their mandate was to help the hungry of the world. Their plane never made it. There was a report that uh, the congressman's plane was missing. I was at home. Uh, in fact, I recall specifically now, El Franco Lee called me, and he said, um, Mickey's plane is missing. And so far, they have gone through the roughest terrain, uh, and they have found no evidence of, of a plane crashing, and that is good news. We had the hope against hope. We had to hold on. It was traumatic. When I first heard that Mickey was lost, He just sucked all the oxygen out of it. Everybody wanted to be next to him. He lived larger than most people. His, he thought larger. He was bigger than that. He was always groping for answers to difficult questions. Apartheid is wrong, it's cruel, and it's evil, and it has to be obliterated. There were problems that he took to heart. And you'd always find him uh, 